friends, I'm Sarah and I'm here to talk about historic costuming and a variety of other things because I have ADHD and I can't stick to just one topic. <sighs> Today though I'm going to be talking about the construction of my under petticoat. I'm slowly working my way through an entire 1860s ensemble from the base layer and underpinnings to the finished gown with both a day bodice and an evening bodice, sometimes called an a transformation gown. Currently, I have a video up about making the drawers. In addition to that, I have constructed the chemise, the corset, the elliptical cage crinoline, and I'm in the process of finishing the petticoat to go over the crinoline to smooth out the bones of it. There are not videos about any of those projects because no one wants to watch me swear that much on the internet. So the elliptical petticoat is all assembled, other than the ruffle. So I'm currently hemming 59, 59, 59 feet of ruffle by hand. Side note, do not buy white cotton gauze on Amazon. It is incredibly tear, pr tear prone and it doesn't do any of the things you wish it would do. Take, take my advice. I have to tell you all something. I had originally filmed this video in a very chatty vlog style, but my camera is still new to me and it doesn't have a cool flip out screen so that I can check and make sure everything's in frame. So I filmed over half of it with my head cut off. Thus, we have entered the phase that I like to call making it up as I go along. So the layer we're talking about today is the under petticoat. The under petticoat was the layer worn over the chemise and drawers and e debatably either under or over the corset. Making up a basic petticoat is not something that should be hard. Even at the time when most women were having their dresses made by professional dressmakers or sometimes having gowns made over by dressmakers, which is a whole other video, they made the basics of shift chemise and petticoats at home because they're all just variations on rectangles and triangles. I am not using a pattern for this. This is a new thing for me. I've been sewing since I was 12. Thanks, Mary Jo. But I've never had a whole lot of luck wandering off the beaten path. For resources this time, I have assembled my own Avengers. Avengers, assemble! The Workwoman's Guide, Bertha Banner's Household Sewing and Guide to Dressmaking, the Incredible Resources at the Foundation's Revealed website, The Victorian Dressmaker by Isabella Pitcher, and The Ladies' Work Table Book. Links for all of these can be found in the description box below, and The Workwoman's Guide, at least, is also available on archive.org. All of these books have the basics, and Household Sewing with Home Dressmaking actually has some really great tips for working at teaching children their very first sewing stitches. And to be honest, I think all of us uh, hand sewers in this day and age need to consider ourselves as children because we haven't been sewing our own undergarments since the moment we could hold a needle. The thing I found most useful in that book is the concept of striking. So striking is apparently a German innovation where you take your needle and you kind of scratch a line um, following a single thread on the underside of your fabric giving you a straight line to follow. It takes the place of either drawing a thread or folding an edge along the selvage to get a straight line. I will be honest, it's sometimes very hard to do and it can be hard to see unless you have good light. But if you do a few inches at a time and make sure you are in a strong light, it can be a huge help to get your seams straight, especially in those rip prone cottons. I find it easier to pull a thread when I'm working in linen, but pulling a thread in cotton or, tr or drawing a thread in cotton is crazy making. So of my resources, the Workwoman's Guide was published in 1838. The Ladies' Work Table Guide was published in 1844. They are therefore the closest resources I have in terms of pri primary references in the time period. Luckily, the Workwoman's Guide also includes the following instructions on page 72. The breadths of flannel are cut according to the height of the person, allowing a good tuck besides, 
to be let down after the petticoat has been washed. I knew from the start I wasn't going to be making my petticoat out of flannel, even though that was the norm at the time. I don't have to worry about unheated houses, and I will likely be wearing this most in the summer. And if I'm wearing a flannel petticoat in the summer, I'm going to melt into a puddle. Instead, I had some cotton left over from my adventures in chemise and drawers making. I had a lot of fun trying to match as many of the big pieces I had left as possible to get the maximum fullness. In the end, I had a little under two meters. Both the Workwoman's Guide and the Ladies' Work Table book recommend gathering the rectangular panels onto a waistband of calico or jean. The Workwoman's Guide says it should be one nail deep when doubled and hemmed. One nail is about two, in two and a half inches. My waistband is just some thicker cotton. It's the same stuff I used to make the body of my chemise. Originally, I'd attach ties, but I was having some issues with bulk at the waist when combined with all of the other garments. So I changed it up for some hooks and eyes. So with the waistband attached, I figured it was time to add a tuck or two to bring it up to the right length. There was just one small problem with that plan. Yeah, I forgot the first instruction. Let's read that again. If I was smart, I'd have bookmarked this. The breadths of flannel are cut according to the height of the person, allowing a good tuck besides to be let down after the petticoat has been washed. Did you catch what I missed? I am not tall. In fact, some people say I am short. I got so worried about making sure that I had enough fabric to get it full enough. I got so worried about making sure I had enough width that I didn't think about how long it was going to be. So I put in a few tucks and I put in a few more. And then the first time I tried it on, I stepped on it on the stairs and nearly broke my neck or ripped it. I don't know what's worse at this point. So I just kept tucking until I couldn't tuck no more. But typically at the time, tucks were the only decoration these got. Other petticoats could have more. Like I said, my o the petticoat that's going over my hoops has a beautiful fluffy flounce on the bottom. But these were your basic layer, in case you fell over and your hoops flipped up. Gotta have something to preserve your modesty. But in the end, it absolutely does its job. Thank you for hanging out with me and joining me in my petticoat making adventures. Just please remember to hit the like button if you liked it and subscribe if you'd like to hear more about my journey into 1860s fashion. See you next time. Bye.